I'd like to read you a book called On the Mayflower by It's a Voyage of the Ship's Apprentice and the Passenger Girl by Kate Waters and Russ Kendall. Let's read together, shall we? On September 6, 1620, the ship Mayflower left England and sailed into the open Atlantic Ocean. The ship's destination was the northern parts of Virginia, near the mouth of the Hudson River. On board were the ship's master, Christopher Jones, about 30 officers and sailors, 102 passengers, and the ship's apprentice, William Small. Only two people on board had ever seen the land they were sailing to. By God's grace, my name is William Small, but I am called Will. I am apprenticed to Christopher Jones, master of the ship Mayflower. I am learning to read maps and charts and to find our ship's position by the sun and the stars and to know the weather. This is my second voyage. I have never before been across the sea, and truth be told, I am fair excited and a bit afraid. As we leave Plymouth Harbour, England, I watch the sailors unfurl and set the sails. The boatswain calls out the orders. All hands ready to sail, sail. Courses in their gear. Heave on the mids and beard. Stand by to loose the four coast sheets. I'm not yet tall enough to climb the rigging, so I help belay the lines. The lines are awkward and sticky with tar. I look back at the land and think of my family. I wonder when I will see them again. Once at sea, Master Jones teaches me to measure the position of the sun and the horizon with a quadrant. It's hard to hold the quadrant steady as the ship pitches and rolls on the waves. My knees will ache mightily until I get accustomed to the motion again. In the round house, we compare the readings to the charts, and Master Jones sets our course for North America. At night, when the wind dies down, the motion settles somewhat. Now I hear the passengers in the tween decks. They sing and pray with good voice. I can smell their food and hear their children squeal and run about. When I fetch the master's meal of oatmeal and peas and pork, John Reynolds, the cook, grumbles about the praying and the chatter. I serve Master Jones, John Clark, the pilot, and William Hall, the boatswain. They are in good spirits now that we are under sail. After our meal, John Clark begins my lessons on the traverse board, where we, which we use to mark the ship's direction and speed. On my way to bed, I peek through the latch. The master would not like me spying, but the people below are a curiosity to me. Tis a small space for a hundred and two people and their belongings. I can hear the passengers complaining about the close quarters and the pitching of the ship. I'm grateful to be up here where there's room to walk about. The days continue fair, and the passengers seem used to being at sea. First thing in the morning, I haul sweet water to wet the boards to keep them tight. A passenger girl comes up on deck to empty a chamber pot. Though I should not linger, I am bold to address her. She says she is called Ellen Moore and is traveling without her parents. How do you keep your days below, I ask? Tis mostly tiresome, she answers. There is so little space and so many people, but I am kept busy. I pit prunes to help with the cooking, she says. I mend the garments. I wet cloths for those with seasickness. 
and I wonder about this place called North America. We have preposterous winds, and Ellen and I converse often. We have prosperous winds, and Ellen and I converse often. Then over half the seas cross, the winds begin to blow mightily, and it gets fierce and cold. One morning, I hear the master's whistle summoning me to the roundhouse. A storm is coming, Yonka, he shouts. Be quick! Tis likely to be a rough one since it's autumn. We must mark our course well. He gives everyone their orders. The sailors clew up and furl the sails against approaching wind. There will be no steering the ship during the storm. We will drift in the hands of God. I call for Ellen and give her the master's orders. Douse your cooking, cooking fire and all the lanterns. A single spark could set the ship afire. Secure all that is likely to roll about. The hatch will be covered until the waves calm. And be brave, Ellen. When night falls, the winds blow mighty fiercely. The sea roars enough to make me deaf, and the waves throw water everywhere. Shivering in my hammock, I hear the sailors running to and fro and the mates shouting orders above the wind. I think of the passengers below in the darkness and cold. No one will have time for their concerns until the danger to the ship is past. There are days and nights of fearful dark and wind and rain. I am kept more busy than before. I keep the gunner relash on the cannon that has loosened during the night. I help the gunner. I pour drink for the tired sailors and listen to their talk. Some fear the ship is not sufficient to withstand the storm. One day when the storm seems less hard, I uncover the hatch and call to Ellen. She comes on deck and gulps the cold, damp air. You are fortunate to be up here in the wind, she tells me. Tis so close and rank below, and tis cruel with only cold food. Everyone suffers from seasickness, and I am kept busy tending them. I worry so for Mrs. Hopkins, who is large with child and cannot find a way to rest. The storm does not relent. One howling day, the carpenter rouses me. Quick, lad, we've leaks to fix. Every man must help. My stomach drops at this dire news. I carry the carpenter's caulking, mallets and irons and the oakum, and climb down into the hold. Black, rank water wets my shoes. We caulk the leaks and more open up. It seems to take hours upon hours. It's hard to hammer true when the ship is rocking as she is. When we finally climb above, I pass the passengers' quarters. There's a mighty stench and many look fair pale. Ellen has said her people pray throughout all the hardship and believe that God will take them safely to the new land. Despite the storm, they try to make a home on this rough ship. I hope their prayers will keep us all safe. I nod to Ellen, but I cannot linger. In a fortnight, the skies begin to clear. On my way across the deck, I see the hatch open a bit. Ellen peeks out and starts, starts us when she sees me. Will, she whispers, is it over? Are we safe? Mrs. Hopkins had her baby three days ago. I don't think we can bear any more. T'will be calm now, pray God. The master will give you leave to be on deck as soon as he is sure. When the passengers come up to get air. Mrs. Hopkins shows me her baby. He is named Oceanus after the sea. What a tiny creature to ride out such a storm. I mend the sail while Ellen tells the news. I tell her about the fearsome days and nights of the storm and the constant tasks and errands I had to do. "'Twas just as bad below,' she says. "'Some said they'd leaf dive and suffer through one more day of such rocking, but our prayers, they were answered. Then on that day, we hear gulls. "'Gulls mean land is near!' 
but by our bearings we are bound for a land called Cape Cod, not Virginia, where the passengers have a patent to settle. The storm has taken us off course. And after a day of trying to sail south past the perilous shoals of Cape Cod, the master meets with the passengers. They agree to try to find safe harbor here, since winter is upon us. The next day I see leaves and branches floating in the water. It has been sixty-five days since we departed from England. Suddenly there's a cry from the working tops. Land ho! We anchor in a protected harbor. And the passengers set about exploring the land. During the months that the passengers build their houses in this cold place, the ship is still their home. Ellen is given leave to come on deck more often, and I have fewer chores to do. We teach each other songs and tell stories of our lives at home. But mostly, we talk about the hardship of the voyage. I can survive anything now, Ellen tells me. Indeed, you are brave, I tell her. With their houses built, the last passengers leave the ship. As the Mayflower sets sail for England, I feel sad, for I will miss Ellen. She's been my family in these days. Looking back on the land, I can see the roofs of the dwellings and the smoke from cooking fires. I wonder if I shall see Ellen again. May God grant you well on this new land, my friend. <laughs>